Welcome to Live at Kigali. This session is called Transboundary Truths. I am Terry Chapman. I'm the curator of the Kigali Global Dialogue, and I am joined by Fahmida Katun, who's the executive director of the Center for Policy Dialogue, and Iche Igwe, who is a visiting fellow at the Feroz Lajil Institute for Africa at the London School of Economics. So let's just dive right in. Um, there's a small handful of high income countries that tend to top all of the rankings for SDGs and progress towards uh, our climate goals. Um, but one of the problems with this is the ways that we measure progress uh, don't account for the ways in which countries' efforts towards sustainable development have negative impacts and consequences for other countries. Um, and they often fail to, the ways that we measure often fail to account for the extractive tendencies of countries and their impacts across their borders. So for example, uh, while Germany has a major focus on ensuring that they're you know, uh, using their water resources sustainably, 80% of the water that's used to uh, produce the products that are consumed in Germany comes from other countries. That's 80%, mostly from India, from Pakistan, from Egypt. And 15% of that water is, is harvested and used unsustainably. And so in many ways, Germany is kind of exporting the use of water to other countries. Um, and again, like similarly, uh, while we see that Sweden has seen major declines in CO2 emissions in recent decades, at the same time, uh, their, their CO2 emissions embedded in imports are not only high, but they're also increasing. So 60% of emissions from Sweden are emitted in other countries. So, at, and this is an important point, right? Because those who argue that decoupling is possible, that we can decouple our economic growth from carbon emissions, often use Sweden as an example, as a success of being able to do that decoupling. But this is not an accurate story. It's not a complete story because we're not accounting for the emissions that they are emitting elsewhere. Okay, so similarly, while we see declines in CO2 emissions over the last two decades in Sweden, we're not accounting for the emissions abroad, right? Actually, Sweden's overall emissions have increased and 60% of their emissions are emitted elsewhere in other countries. And this is super important. This is key because we assume or we are betting on the idea that we can decouple economic growth from carbon emissions. But the problem is, is that we're not accounting for all emissions. 60% of Sweden's emissions are emitted elsewhere and that's not accounted for. And so this decoupling story is an incomplete story. So um, let's be clear, right? Uh, we have to consider and evaluate progress towards the SDGs and towards our climate goals at the global level in addition to the domestic level. So first I wanna turn it over to Fahmida. Can you kind of give us a sense of the scale of these transboundary issues? To what extent are we seeing high income countries exporting their development progress and all of the externalities of that process to lower and middle income countries? Um, thank you, Terry. This is a very important question because if you look at the, the origin of the problem itself, that also had been created in the developed countries. So historically, because of their economic activities and because of their lifestyles, we have seen high consumption. And then as a result, we have seen now the pollution, global warming, climate change problems. Now, as we are progressing, we are seeing that countries are becoming increasingly aware and conscious about their responsibility. And there are global calls, there are global platforms for that. For example, COP meetings are one of the you know, platforms where countries commit themselves. And definitely the advanced countries are well ahead of this because this also requires a lot of investment. So while they are being able to clean up their economic sectors, industries, their lifestyles, but the other countries, the low income and middle income countries are not being able to do that because they don't have that scale of money or technology or the capacity. And the point you have raised that many of the cleaning exercises in the developed economies are being held um, in exchange of transporting them to the other, to the low income countries. In fact, this is not a new phenomenon. It has always been there because this dumping of, uh, you know, the wastes 
um, which are hazardous human, uh, to he human health and also to the environment. That has been happening for decades. And now we are seeing that in terms of you know, exports and imports, if you look at the carbon embeddedness in a product itself, where are the, whose products are containing more carbons? None of the least developed countries or none of the low income countries are the exporters of that because you know they are uh, at the recipient end. So the, now we have to think in a different way, different um, you know statistics or different indexes. These indexes which are being used globally uh, that you know sustainable development index or clean index or these new indexes are coming up. But then you will have to have the common denominators, because each country, all countries are not in the same you know, plane. Um, so that is why you know, there, is a, there should be a shift in the whole exercise and also the way it is measured. There have been a long debate um, in terms of per capita emission that maybe you, know, you are reducing, but if you look at the per capita scale, then it is way, way better, way, way higher. But you know, to sum up the issue, I would say that this is a global problem and no country can do better by keeping other countries in the problem, into the problem. This, uh, the climate change is a cross-border problem. So is economic problem because the world economy is integrated with each other through investment, through trade, through uh, remittances, through foreign aid, to many other economic activities. So one problem created in one country, it just gets spilled over to each and every other country, which we are observing now. COVID has shown how it has you know, spread all over the world. Now the war has shown. So the COVID, the war, and the climate change, they are creating such a problem that each one of us are into the problem. So we have to think in a coordinated, in a collective manner. Yeah, that's absolutely the point. I think, um, you know, you highlight the point that these are all global challenges that we're facing, right? And as high income countries, especially try to find solutions that work for themselves, it doesn't mean that that's a solution for other countries. In fact, it often ends up being the key problem for other countries. So, um, Uche, I want to turn, this, turn to you and ask you the same question. What's the scale of the problem? What are the key kind of facets of this issue of the climate boundary sort of exporting of the externalities of development, the development process? What's the scale of the problem? The scale of the thank you very much, uh, uh, Terry, for this uh, very interesting conversation. The scale of the problem is very huge, I must say, and I think I find it difficult to exonerate uh, some developed countries from what is currently happening in these developing countries. In Nigeria, where I come from, the fuel that uh, supports the prosperity in the West comes from a country like Nigeria, at least part of it, that remains the global capital of poverty. And uh, this is inexplicable uh, because um, the footprints of oil extraction still uh, exists, the pollution still exists. And you know, we agreed uh, globally uh, as part of the SDGs that the polluter must pay for the cost of the pollution. So what we are seeing in Nigeria is a situation where uh, we are talking about transition, energy transition. Energy can, transition cannot be just an inclusive unless that these footprints of uh, ecological devastation, inexplicable pollution, uh, in countries like Nigeria and other developing countries and in communities where this energy that first prosperity is produced, unless there is ecological justice, unless there is cleanup um, holistically, I think it is it's difficult to exonerate one country. The same way it is difficult to go into a blame game. I think that it is important to trace the roots of this problem and tackle them holistically. Um, while there are efforts um, that, that could be acknowledged here and there, but I think that uh, especially uh, the countries that have benefited uh, from this energy must take it as a responsibility in line with globally agreed initiatives to clean up the pollution 
to bear the cost of the ecological footprints, negative ecological footprints that they have left in countries like Nigeria. The same way I speak about energy transition, uh, I speak about the transition minerals, the transition minerals that really will power energy transition still come from countries like Nigeria, countries like DRC, if you talk about cobalt, talk about lithium, talk about copper, they come from Africa. And interestingly, many of these countries are in conflict. You cannot discuss, for instance, the conflict in Sudan, the ongoing conflict in Sudan completely without talking about oil. So I think, you know, it is tantamount, in my view, to hypocrisy to find ways of exonerating some countries, especially the developed countries, who benefited directly and indirectly, you know, from uh, the extractive resources from the developing countries in this whole uh, um, climate, uh, I mean, climate crisis and all of that. So I think that we need a deliberate conversation. You know, we need interrogation. We need to stop the blame game. And we need to understand that no sustainable development is complete when one part of the world is polluted and devastated while another part it is not. So we need to come together as one world and tackle these issues holistically. I couldn't agree more. And I think um, the scale of the problem is so complex and it's also interrelated from climate to food insecurity to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I mean, all of these issues are interrelated and coming up with solutions, as you said, is going to require collaboration. It's going to require collaboration on more equal footing um, between countries in such a way that the high income countries that have caused the problem of climate change, right, who continue to exploit people and resources and the climate at the expense of other countries need to take responsibility for that. But we need to find ways of actually doing that in an equitable and just way. And the problem is, is that the way that we measure these issues and progress towards them does not allude to or adequately account for these transboundary effects. And we continue to say that high income countries are doing such a great job. We're reducing emissions, we're reforesting, we're, you know, being conscious about our use of water. And yet we are not accounting for the negative consequences and the effects in other countries. And it's not acceptable. It's not going to get us to a point where we can all live in a sustainable place and where everyone can reach a certain quality of life, um, which has not been attained in most of the world because of the excessive consumption in high income countries, um, which has driven this mass of exploitation. So I want to quickly turn it back to you, Fafnida. In terms of next steps, I mean, we can and should dismantle all of these systems and rethink them, but we also need to start rebuilding and thinking about how we're going to move forward. So what do you think? What do we need to do? Yes, for rebuilding, I think it is important to have institutions. The institutions which we have currently are not functioning properly because the um, international organizations which are dedicated to work for climate issues, which will benefit all countries, including the low and middle income countries, poor countries, uh, they, are, they need reforms actually because the issues and the governance of these institutions are designed in such a way that the rich and advanced countries have, have a grip on those organizations. And, and that is why, despite all the good commitments at various platforms, we don't see any implementation, any achievement. For example, the climate finance, which have been committed in 2009, um, we are still way, way behind to fulfill that climate fund. And um, also in terms of you know, the division of climate fund, if you see the composition um, of the fund that we would see that funds for mitigation is far, far more than funds for adaptation. Whereas countries, the vulnerable countries, they need adaptation funds more. Here we see that the ratio is 70-30 or 65-35, but the vulnerable countries, they need, because they are at the victims, they are at the recipient end, they don't, their consumption, you know, energy consumption is very, very low. The emission is very, very low, insignificant. It will take years to, you know, to reach that level um, as the advanced countries are having now. So they need adaptation, and for that, they need 
investment and also technological um, you know support capacity building so this is one and the other is that uh, the whole uh, you know idea of uh, this loss and damage now that compensation um, so climate fund is one we are seeing that progress is very disappointing but then, then after a long debate and discussion this uh, issue of loss and damage has been recognized I would say this is a progress a step forward but then the real you know implementation is uh, will be will be the, a, a tested you know issue in the coming days some countries have already shown their commitment which is a welcome move but then the others will have to follow suit. Um, that's why, because this is a historical crime, you can say, that these countries have done uh, to the, uh, the poor countries which, for which they are suffering generations after generation. So I would say that with um, commitments to uh, solve the problems, the issues, the problems can be solved, and there should be a total reform in the multilateral organizations, which are connected to climate issues, but also connected to the financial multilateral development banks, for example, bilaterals, and also multilateral development organizations. Those have to come to the, you know, to a point where they have to change the whole, the way of doing things in a new way. Steps forward, how are we gonna move forward? Yes, um, there's um, a lot to do to move forward. First is that I think it is important to create a space for a contextual conversation around the table. Countries of the world are not at the same level. And uh, for a country like Nigeria and many extractive, uh, I mean, many countries who depend on the extractive industry for prosperity, I think it's important to take them into consideration. In the next 20 to 25 years, the world will still be needing about 100 million barrels of oil per day. How can we think about issues of technology, for instance, to make sure that the oil endowment or destructive endowment in these countries can power an industrialization phase while recognizing that energy transition is here and while insisting that the mistakes of the past will not be repeated. So we need a nuanced conversation that is context specific, recognizing that countries of the world are at different levels and bringing these differences in context into consideration when we commit to uh, agreements at the global level and following this sequentially, systematically and holistically, bearing in mind that what hurts one person at the developed end of the world also hurts other persons at the developing end of the world. It's essentially that we have one world, and if we must pursue sustainable development, it has to be such that will be inclusive, holistic, and long-term.